ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له جل عن المثيل والشبيه والكفء والنظير واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد بن عبد الله عبده ورسوله ادى الامانه ونصح الامه وكشف الغمه وتركنا على المحجه البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها الا هالك فصلوات ربي وسلامه عليه وعلى اله الطيبين واصحابه الغر ميمين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه في الدين بدعه وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وإنما توعدون لآت وما أنتم بمعجزين قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد we praise Allah عز وجل we thank him we testify the fact that there is nothing worthy of our worship our love our obedience in the most complete sense of those words other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we testify to the fact that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his true servant and his final messenger whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave as a mercy to the entire creation and whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave for every single one of us for you and for me as the most complete and the most perfect role model and guide for whoever is looking for happiness and success and goodness in this world and in the next whomever Allah azza wa jal guides none can lead them astray and whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to remain astray because that's the path that they have chosen for themselves then none can guide them after welcoming my brothers and sisters to another beautiful day the the day of juma being able to gather here being able to perform the greatest salah of the week together in this university may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every single one of you may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your families may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us always to have the tawfiq always to have the will always to have the desire to be in the places that he loves doing the things that he loves until we meet him subhanahu wa ta'ala allahumma amin uh, one of my favorite moments from our history uh, a moment that was one of the first times you can say that you have the muslim civilization in all of its beautiful simplicity right some people think because it was simple that it was simplistic it was simple no doubt the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the companions lived very simple lifestyles up until this point there was not a lot of wealth there was not a lot of technological advancement but they had something very special right they had la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah and they're meeting with as they're moving beyond the confines of the arabian peninsula they're meeting with the technological and the social superpower of that time literally the most powerful empire of that time when the muslims were at the doorsteps of the city of madain madain was the most populated and the largest city in the entire world okay and the muslims were on the doorsteps of what was known as the battle of qadisiyah sure you may have heard the name and there was a moment before this battle that i think is a moment that every single muslim especially living here as we live as minorities in a time and in a place where there's always this fear of you know are we going to last right as a faith are we going to last and keep our morals keep our culture or are we going to just melt and dissolve into this large melting pot right are we going to just lose our identity until we become a people who say at one point i remember 
my grandfather, my great grandfather used to say something like this, used to pray, used to do these things. And we're already starting to see that in different forms. But this moment here is an example of these two civilizations coming together in the form of one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, who is called to meet with the emperor or the uh, main general of the Persian Empire. His name was Rustum. Okay, he is basically second, the second hand command, yani in second in command to the empire, the emperor himself. And he calls the leader of the Muslim army, a man by the name of Rabi ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala. And he sets up the tent or the palace where he's meeting him with all of the luxuries and all of the material worldly things that you would expect people who only focus on the material and the worldly to have. The gold and the glitz and the glamour and the, and the silk and the silver. He's trying to intimidate Rabi ibn Amr. And Rabi ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, he walks in with not just courage, but with a pride that was instilled in him by his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he stands in front of Rabi, uh, he stands in front of Rustam. And Rustam asks him with the arrogance again of, of only, the arrogance of someone who can only see what's in front of him with his own eyes. And he says, what brought you here, O Arabs of the desert? The people that we used to throw the crumbs off of our tables to. Right? What brought you here? If it's wealth that you're looking for, right? because we know that you're a Bedouin people in the middle of the desert, you don't have much. The Arabs were disregarded. That's why there was no conquests of Arabia at that time, because they didn't see any value to them. So he says, if it's wealth that brought you here, we'll send each of you back with a dinar, a gold coin, and we'll send you as the leader back with two. You can go back and have something. If it's leadership that you're looking for, right, you're looking for direction and guidance from the Persian Empire, we'll send you one of our generals, one of our leaders, and he'll be your leader. Right? And I want you to imagine if you're watching this on the TV, right, like you have the screen in front of you and the, and the volume is turned off. And you see Rustum, and you can imagine what he's dressed like and what he looks like, and you have all of the guards around him, and you have the glitz and the glamour of the Persian Empire, and then you have Rabi ibn Amr, and the narrations mention that he walks in with tattered clothes, and he walks in with a tattered animal, and he has just his spear with him, and he's dragging it on the ground, ripping the carpet as he goes. Can you imagine, like, if you were asked to describe this scene, or to you are asked, who's the one in charge here? Who has the izza? Who has the honor? Who has the power? Right? It's very clear. From a material perspective, it's not even close. Rustum is the one who's in charge. Rustum is the one who's impressive. But then if you lifted up, if you turned up the volume, you would see something and you would hear something very different. And you would hear that the power was not in the hands of Rustum or in the Persian army. But it was with Rabi ibn Amr radiallahu anhu. May not have had the wealth, may not have had the numbers, but he had what we mentioned. He had the izza that was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by following his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he said, when he was asked, what brought you here? He said three things. And I want you to remember these three things. Because I believe that these are three things that gave the sahaba radiallahu anhum the courage and the strength and the confidence to not dissolve in what seemed to be a much more advanced or much more progressive society. But what gave them the strength, not just to spread the message, but to live with that izzah, to live with that honor and with that pride of having been given the truth. He said, radiallahu ta'ala, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, I want you to take this as also something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. Because like Rabi ibn Amr, who was a messenger of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? He is passing on and he's living the message that was sent 
and that was given to the Messenger وسلم, each and every single one of you have been commissioned with the same task, have been commissioned and given the same gift that Ibn radiallahu anhu and the Sahaba were given. He said, radiallahu anhu, ibta'athan Allah, firstly Allah Azza wa Jal sent us to do what? He said, لِنُخْرِجَ ibad مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ he says, number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to take people out of the worship, the enslavement to creation. The enslavement of those who themselves are slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To take people out of this servitude and to put them or to get them, give them freedom to be the slaves of the one who is the Lord of everything. Right? And that's what Islam gives us, brothers and sisters. Islam is the only thing that gives us meaningful, long-lasting, authentic and real freedom and liberation. Freedom not just from servitude to mankind, but freedom even from servitude to our own desires. Freedom from being enslaved to the trends and the biases and the cultures of our time. Freedom from the standards of others. Freedom from the systems that when we look at may seem to be giving freedom, but are actually substituting one cage for another. A lot of times we think freedom is being able to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do that. But we realize that those who live in that way, are they actually free? Or are they actually just enslaved to another type of enslavement? Are they just enslaved to other people, to corporations, to the media? Are they enslaved to their own desires? And that's why the great poet, Muhammad Iqbal, he said something beautiful. I don't know the Urdu. But he said, in Engl- uh, the translation of which, by making one prostration, by making one sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you free yourself from a thousand other sajdas. You free yourself from enslavement to everything and anything else. That's actual liberation. To actually be able to live your purpose and to live what you actually are, which is a slave and a servant to Allah Azza wa Jal, the greatest master, the most merciful master, and the most loving master. So number one, he's reminding us that true Freedom and liberation comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being freed from the enslavement of everything else. Then he says, number two, وَابْتَعَثَنَا لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ جَوْرِ الْأَدْيَانِ إِلَىٰ عَدْلِ الْإِسْلَامِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to take people out of the injustice, the oppression of any and all other systems to the freedom and to the justice of Islam. Every system, every ism that is created and that is formulated and developed by a human being is by its definition and by necessity going to be flawed because it's coming from those who are flawed. But the, the, the system that is perfect, that is beyond and outside of the biases and outside of the short-sightedness, and outside of the inability to see the consequences of things, that's the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And when we see, right, look, if you take a step back and you recognize, look, everyone, there's certain truths and there's certain ideals that everyone recognizes is good and recognizes is bad, right? Everyone knows that kindness and that justice and that truth and that freedom are good things, right? But what actually is the path to get to those things? We're in election season now, right? And both sides, as they attack each other and as they try to give their own pitch, both sides are in essence saying the same thing. Our path is the path of morality. Our path is the path of goodness. Our path is the path towards justice and all of these things. But the actual path that takes us to these things, this is what Islam provides us in such a beautiful way. If you don't believe me, 
Look at our history. Look at the reality that actually worked. Imagine a society where in one generation, in one generation, alcoholism is eliminated from a society. This happened in the generation of the Prophet ﷺ, never happened again after that. Imagine a society where racism and tribalism are actually stamped out within one generation. Imagine a society where there's economic justice. Imagine a society that went from being like animals, the laws of the jungle, to being a society where the individual, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, their mercy extended even to animals. This is something that happened in our history. Why? Because of what Rabbi radiallahu an said. And for us to recognize that this deen that Allah Azza wa has given us goes and transcends past every other ism, past, past every other system, and gives us actual freedom and truth and justice. And then the third thing that he said, he said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us also, وَابْتَعَثَنَا لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادِ to take the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the constrictedness of this world, the restrictiveness of this world to the vastness of this world and the next. And there's a lot that can be said about this. But we know, brothers and sisters, that the ones who limit themselves to this world, that the only thing that they see in this is, is this world, that they live lives that are extremely depressing, that are extremely sad, and that are extremely short-sighted. Imagine you lose someone and you know or you feel that's it. I will never be able to see them again. There's no hope after this. Imagine then what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, which is the expansiveness of this world and the next. And the greatest of the expansiveness of this world is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us access to Him, gave us the ability to have a relationship with Him. And that's why Abdullah ibn Mubarak, one of the great ascetics of this ummah from the early generations, he would, he would say, Masakinu ahli dunya. He would say, How unfortunate. How miserable are the people of this dunya? <clears throat> they left from it and they didn't taste the sweetest thing that's in it. And he, they asked him, what's the sweetest thing that's in it? He said, Ma'rifatullahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have a relationship with Allah. The vastness of recognizing that you have someone who took care of you, who looks after you who never betrays you, who never disappoints you, who promises you goodness in this world and the next, and then who promises you an akhirah that's vast, more vast than anything that this world can contain. That's what Rabbi radiallahu an and these companions radiallahu anhum, this is what they held on to. That gave them the confidence, that gave them the pride, that gave them the strength to live their deen with that type of izzah, with that honor. That they were proud of what they had, not just for the sake of, well, I was in, this it was something that was inherited, I inherited this, my parents are this, and so I am this. No, they had izza because what they had was a source of izza. They had izza because what they had was the ultimate truth, what they had was the ultimate guidance, what they had was ultimate justice for everybody. And that's what each and every single one of you have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we're not able to fully appreciate it because we don't give it that same attention, that same focus, that same recognition that these sahaba did. And that's why those who are given it have an additional responsibility to rediscover and to find <clears throat> and to appreciate this gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. When you ever, whenever you feel that, you know, maybe... You know, this is, it's too hard. It's too hard to live as a Muslim in college. It's too hard to be visible as a Muslim. I don't know what I'm proud of. Remember the statement of Ibn radiallahu anhu. Remember him standing in front of the superpower of that time. And remember the izzah that he had by saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us, لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ وَمِنْ جَوْرِ الْأَدْيَانِ إِلَىٰ عَدْلِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَمِنْ ضِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سَعَةِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ These are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم.
الحمد لله الحمد لله على فضله وإحسانه وأشكره على توفيقه وامتنانه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له تعظيما لشأنه وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد بن عبد الله عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى رضوانه أما بعد فأوصي نفسي وإياكم بتقوى الله عز وجل ثم أعلموا عباد الله أن الله سبحانه وتعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ فيه بنفسه وثن بملائكته وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون فقال عز من قال إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وذل الشرك والمشركين ودمر عداءك عداء الدين اللهم صل المسلمين والمصدعفين والمجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم كن لهم معينا ونصيرا ومؤيدا وظاهرا اللهم حرر المسجد الأقصى المبارك ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وأبلنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب يا ولي الإسلام وأهله مسكنا الإسلام حتى نلقاك عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون